Hey, Zach, you're muted. And we're live at Deconstructing Data Rooms. Here we are. Welcome, everybody. Uh, i got a good group here. I'm really happy to be here. For those of you that don't know me, I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I'm Zach Storms, founder of Startup TNT, along with Tim Lin. Tim, you want to say hello? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. So at Startup TNT, we have now helped 24 companies raise money from about 136 investors in our network. They've raised close to $4 million. And one of those investors who's been with us from the very beginning is none other than Brendan Hans. Brendan, how are you doing? Good, Zach. How are you? I'm doing well. And um, I will say like a few observations about our community right now. I was just telling someone else this. Uh, we got a summit going live right now. We had, I think, 35 Edmonton companies apply to it. And hands down, highest median quality of all applicants we've had. Uh, investors got a tough decision coming up right now about which companies they, they put in the top 10. Uh, and it's going to be a serious battle for those top five positions. And, you know, I, I personally think, maybe Tim, I'll let Tim and Brendan jump in. One of the key differences that's going to that's gonna put people into the top echelon is, aside from, of course, having a great business and team and an opportunity, but being able to communicate that really effectively to the investors. And one of the ways to do that, one of the most effective ways to do that when you get into the thick of due diligence is none other than the data room. Oh, yeah. It's always it's always really fun. Uh, once we get to the top 10, top five decision, it's sort of like, ah, we, we, I really like them. They, these guys, I don't know how organized they, they are. And then you get the other folks like these guys are really organized. They have a data room like they have all of their shit is together. This is fantastic. They're, they're definitely good. <laughs> Um, guys, why don't we, we're going to, we're going to talk about data rooms today and we're going to talk about kind of the checklist that we use that actually these two guys created for us at Start TNT. Um, and we, I want to make sure that the audience knows that this is interactive. I want you to interrupt us with questions. Um, like Gino Jensen has like a hand waving. Is that a question, Gino, or are you just waving at us in the chat there? <laughs> hey, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. Um, so let's just give everyone a little bit of context. Brendan, starting with you. Brendan, tell us about your background and what you currently do as a professional full-time. Uh, it's a bit of an eclectic background, but I, uh, I spent the better part of the last decade uh, working in family business, uh, which we ultimately sold in 2017. And we had something like 350 employees working for us um, you know, across Canada. And, uh, and then through that process, obviously, it got a chance to build out a pretty robust data room for, for, for an exit. And um, it's a really good learning experience uh, for this. Um, and since then, I've been supporting startups here in Edmonton, uh, doing some fractional CFO consulting work, uh, as well as managing sort of a family, small family office, you could call it. Can you share the names of any company that you work with, or is that proprietary? Uh, yeah, I work with G2V Optics, uh, G2V working, Optics. With, working with True Angle right now. Um, Tim and I are working with Poppy Barley uh, as, as one of our clients. And so we have a few other ones that, uh, that we support on a day-to-day -day basis, but Those are um, companies. yeah, that's really good. And uh, Tim, we all know that you helped us co-found TNT, but what else do you do, Tim? Tell us more. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here with both my partners. So obviously with, with you on startup TNT and then with Brendan on the, on the, depending on, the day, what we want to call it, uh, we'll call it Opus um, for the consulting side of life, um, as Brendan alluded to on the fractional CFO side of things, you know, also in the mix is quote to me, uh, one of the companies that came to the, <laughs> came to the summit. Um, so, so yeah. Um, yeah. And then in terms of background, uh, of course, you know, seen a bunch of companies through TNT and investing on, on that side of life. And then, you know, representing companies as well in my past life, I uh, was with, at Deloitte and corporate finance, helping people sell their companies. So on the more um, traditional mid-market, um, more traditional data room, definitely like far more involved than we need to on the startup side. And then before that um, was a, had a startup that I was involved with, like on a full-time basis where we were, we were doing a, we'll call it a seed round, like a million dollar round. And then we also exited as well. So um, data rooms involved on, on that side of life as well. So I'm been doing it for a little bit here. Okay, are we ready to dive in? Everybody ready to dive into data rooms? I put a subtitle for Tim and I that this would be Tim and Zach nerding out on data rooms. So I'm glad that we got 28 people nerding out with us, uh, including special guest Brendan Hans, who uh, I put in Brendan's calendar. I wasn't sure he was going to join us. I forgot to add you to the program, Brendan. So we're just going to call you special guest. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay, let's start off. Let's let's go back. Let's walk back a little bit. Let's get, let's start from the beginning. So uh, companies are looking to raise money. Um, at, you know, tell us exactly what is the data room and where does it fit into the fundraising journey? So maybe maybe taking a step back, um, the process process of raising money and how it kind of goes. Um, we'll say that you'll send a you'll send a deck over like the written PDF version of it uh, to somebody that you know you want to meet with or you get an intro to or whatever. They review it. They're like, all right, this this company seems legit. We should have a conversation. You have a conversation. You walk them through the deck. You have you know an hour long conversation. Maybe a follow up conversation to talk through some more of this stuff. And they're like, all right, this is pretty legit. Let's put together a quick term sheet here or or come into a little bit more. A um, little bit more detail. I want to see a little bit behind the scenes, and then you share a data room with them that has, you know, kind of the behind the scenes portion of of the activities, um, so that they're able to do a little bit of their confirmatory diligence before writing the check. Make sure that it's actually a real company. Um, to make sure that uh, yeah, everything's all together. Everything that someone would want to know about the company, they can find in the data room. Easy. Yeah, to and and for clarity, it could be used for. You know, raising capital could be used for selling a company. It could be used for debt financing with your bank. Yeah. Um, could be used used in, in a number of contexts, but um, could specifically be used for yourself to make sure you're taking care of everything at your company. A hundred percent. Which I almost think in, in early stage companies, when you're raising, you know, your first round, that's almost the more important aspect to the data room. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a couple of uh, somebody asked if we have a link to our checklist. Um, we do. Um, I, we're actually going to share our screens in a second and show you our checklist, and we'll make sure that we'll. I can. I might be able to dig up the link that's in a, in a view that everyone can look at. Or if Brandon's still here, he can he can throw it in the chat there for us. Um, but we can also certainly email it around to everyone after the fact. I'll, I'll um, find it on our drive right now. You can find it on the drive right now. Tim's going to find out in the drive. Um, I want to ask Brandon Hans a question about data rooms because this comes up a lot, and I, so let's just ask it right off the bat, which is, do you need to make the investor sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement to see your data room, Brendan? And like, what, how should you deal with what you think is, you know, sensitive information you're concerned about? Yeah, I think, I think there's, I mean, there's probably two schools of thought on this. Um, what I've seen done in the past is that, you know, you might have a light, a light due diligence room that has like, um, you know, maybe less corporate documents, less HR type sensitive information. Um, that you could share with like a broad audience that, you know, maybe you have an investor who's interested, but you don't know what level of interest they have. Um, you could create a light version of it that you could share with those types of folks. And then you could have a more detailed version of the due diligence room um, that has like, you know, all sorts of documents in it uh, that could be shared with more serious investors or maybe under NBA. And I know Tim has like a, I think pretty hard stance on not making folks sign non-disclosure agreements because it creates friction in the process, but you know, it kind of, it's, it may be a little bit more dependent on the company uh, and, and what you're trying to do. Yeah. Tim, any, any uh, further thoughts to add about the NDAs and, and when to use them, if to use them? Yeah. I mean, I would probably, I would imagine that like, the only time really that you really need an NDA um, is if you're sharing IP that hasn't been filed yet so that it doesn't become prior art. Um, so like in deep tech uh, investing, there's generally people are familiar with it. In traditional VC, I would say that people are typically not used to signing NDAs and it's just, you know, anything you're doing that's off market throws a flag and people wonder why and what's going on. So I'd avoid mm. it as best as possible. And we should probably qualify that with like, this is may maybe more of a legal question for, you know, if you have specific advisors that, that you're working with, you know, sometimes this is a good question to maybe ask your lawyer. But like, you know, to, the, to that end, like I would, I, would in, I endeavor to, you know, make a more public facing uh, due diligence room or a, a, a virtual data room um, that can be shared, um, you know, removing customer names if that's relevant or, um, blanking out specific things. Uh, and then if there's, you know, maybe there's like a second layer uh, where there's more detail that's behind the curtain even further if it's needed to uh, post NDA. Uh, yeah. And so I think this is actually, you guys lead into another question, which is like, who should you be sharing the, the data room with? It definitely has sensitive information, even if you're not signing an NDA, like this is sensitive information about you and your customers and your company. Um, I think you need a little bit level of trust uh, in who you're sharing it with. Um, 
So thoughts on when to share the NDA, like in, in the conversational due diligence process, guys. Yeah, like the, the VDR, yeah, like um, the, you know, like I, like I was suggesting, like post, post having a conversation with them where they're interested and like they want to learn more, they're, you know, gen, it's, you know, not just, yeah, let's have a conversation. It's more like, okay, we've had a conversation. We're like genuinely interested in investing. Let's like see what we can do to get this along the path to, to getting a check across the line. Um, that'd be kind of the thing. It wouldn't be yeah. something that okay. would be. I'm also going to pause here and congratulate the audience for having 34 people in attendance. There was only 34 signups the last time I checked. So I don't know how everyone's here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, guys, you know what we're going to do? Um, I'm going to, I have, I have a sample data room. <laughs> Let's see what does a data room look like? It's very exciting. Here's the Zach Storm sample data room. Ta-da. Are you guys all looking at my screen now? This I like, is... I like folder nine. Folder nine beer. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is not really that exciting. So the data room is basically like a well-organized folder that someone could easily navigate with like, um, you know, obvious, I mean, not like practical headings that the investor would expect to see. Do, do you, would you say that this is like a cut and dry, you must use these kind of nine headings, especially the last one, or would you say that there's a lot of flexibility? here? Yeah, I'd say that, you know, any, however many number of folders is relevant, um, that ninth one is probably the most important one, but um, yeah. However, however you choose to categorize things in a way that an external person will be able to read is probably a really good way to do it. Um, there's some standard standard categorizations, but uh, yeah, this is good. Um, and what about navigating the data room? You know, I think, you know, you guys have a checklist. Does it make sense to try and almost build like a table of contents or an index for your data room so the investor can be like, kind of see exactly what's there with a snapshot? Yeah, so Oh, go ahead, Tim. <clears throat> go for it. I was just going to say, like, the easier it is to navigate, the less time someone's going to spend. Look, I, at least from my perspective, they're going to spend less time sort of looking at it and more time just saying, ah, they have most of this stuff and it's well, really well organized. You know, if, if you put in your corporate documents and they're all not named properly and there's just stuff everywhere, then it then it takes someone a lot of time to go through it. And so I think my I think our messaging to folks that are building this stuff out is you want to make it really, really simple for the users of your, of your data room um, to find information. The, the point of this is then to signal the people that you're organized. If you have a disorganized data room, it kind of makes it a, a negative exercise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's also easier than ever using something like Google drive to, uh, to make a link data room or like table of contents. So but um, the, to that, to the point um, that you were asking about an index or, or something like that, like modifying the document that we shared in the in the chat there, um, and for the folks on YouTube and LinkedIn Live, I'm sure that it might be on our website. I don't know. We'll figure out a way to share it with with everybody. Post this, um, but you know, sharing a modified version of that that's very tailored to what you specifically have that kind of has some notes as to. You know, maybe some of those things are, are in your deck and you can point to specifically which, which slides or like, you know, in conversation, you, you're identifying some of those items, but reorganizing that list and making it so that it makes sense and references specific folders in here and then posting that up, whether it's in this main like parent folder or even in the company overview folder alongside your deck so that people have a map of the data room is, is really helpful. So. Well, I feel like we should head to that map. Who's ready? Because like, if I click on one of these documents, unfortunately, it's empty. So this is <laughs> a bare bones data room. Just a, just a dream I have to one day create a data room. <laughs> um, okay. Let's open up. I think it's this one. Let's see if I have the right. I think you're right, Zach. Data room. Here it is, this tear sheet. Um, okay. If there's any questions coming in, throw them out to us. I, um, I have the chat up, but I'll, I don't know. I don't know if you have the document up, Zach. But all I can see is your finder window, like where you open the document from. Oh boy. Okay. Let's try this again. How's this? Oh, there she goes. Oh, there's the document. Okay. Look at this document. This is actually good. So, just why don't you guys tell us a little bit of background on this document? Because I know that you guys built it, and I know that you guys use it in your line of work. How'd you build this? Yeah, this one actually is, this one isn't exactly the same one as 
the length. Um, some of the scores are a little bit different because we had, <laughs> there's a longer list, but this is a, this is a subset of the really big list. So we just killed a whole bunch of the lower priority items and then didn't reprioritize. So everything looks like it's high priority. Okay. Um, should, I, should I share the, that one in the link then? I thought they were the same. <laughs> they're, they're almost the same. Um, and people kept on asking what vendor comments meant. So we changed that to just comments. Um, but uh, yeah, broadly, this comes from, you know, it's, it's a largely like a, a checklist to build out those folders that you're referencing, Zach. Um, so people don't necessarily have all of these things, um, but the, the, the number one items, especially in the, in the template are, are the pretty key ones that for sure are documented um, that, that need to be there, like financial documents and like legal documents that need to be around. And then a lot of the other stuff can be done through the deck or through conversation and stuff like that, but could, could be helpful to have some supporting documentation. All right. And so once you walk us through that number system you have there, we see ones, twos, threes. <laughs> Do you want to pull up the other one so it's not all ones and twos? Let's see if we can do this again. Zach, the link's in the chat. Yeah, I just got the link. Okay, let's try this again. Let's see if we can pull up the right document. Here, does this look right? Yeah, better. That's the one. Okay, now we should all be looking at it. There's a, there's at least thirteen of us or twenty of us looking at this document right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, maybe there, there's a lot on here. It's a little intimidating. So it's, yeah, just kind of give us a little insight there. Like one, two, three. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Big, the big Go. buckets sack are just like the the head uh, folders that you'd want to use. So you know, put the easy stuff that you can, you know, the overview of your business into the overview folder. And if you're talking about uh, building out a light version of the data room, maybe that's the folder that you share with an investor who you've presented to and you're interested in, uh, and they're interested in learning a little bit more about the business. Maybe that's your level one um, version of your data room. And then, you know, as you go down, you'll see like financials, corporate documents, financing documents um, in each of the big folders and then you'd build out like the actual documents that need to go into those folders and I like to label them so that it's nice and neat so if financial you know you'd have your last five five years of financials if that's available and you'd label the, all of those as 2.1 you know whatever year the financial statements are so that it's really really obvious and clear that you have all of your stuff in uh, in the data room to to answer um Zach I think you're asking about the column d like the colored numbers yeah. Um, the number ones are like the definitely need this, like essentially as a document or in your pitch deck. There's some of the ones that are a little bit lower down that are, um, for in the pitch deck. Um, the, you know, everything else is more, more nice to have. And it kind of rolls down from there. Um, almost all of the ones are documents except for, uh, let me look where, where we're at here. Um, things like in product development, um, which is section six and seven sales, sales and customers and strategy and stuff like that. That can be done through the deck and through conversations. Um, but most of these other items, you know, example, the budget model, um, cap table, those are, those are pretty, pretty simple documents that kind of need to be done as table stakes. If you're looking for yeah. you know, 500, a mil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I do want to stress for people that might be intimidated by this list, like depending where you're at as a company, it might not make sense to try and include every single item on this like 64 point checklist, you know, it would you be add them in as you grow and, and where appropriate and what is suitable for, for your stage and your sector and the type of company that you are. Mm. Um, any, any further thoughts on that in terms of building this out over time as you grow as a company? Uh, yeah, it'd be insane if you had a data room that was like this full. It's almost like there's a balance to it as well, where, you know, if you, if it's like too organized, it's sort of, or it's, if it's like too, too much, it's like, Oh my God, like is this person even working on the business. This thing is like, <laughs> and this is a team of three people. Spent 12 like, years building an awesome data room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 12 months. Um, but, okay. I, but I can tell you that if you're, if you're going through a subsequent funding round, so like, let's say you've did your seed, you know, maybe you're doing a convertible bridge round with like someone like BDC, most of this information in here is going to be required. <clears throat> and so I think it's just a good guide. Yeah. It's not a rule, but it's a guide to what you might need as you go through the funding process. 
Um, it's also not exhaustive. Like the further you, the more complex the business gets and the further you get along, the bigger this document gets um, and the more diligence that might be required. Yeah, and actually you kind of touched on something there, which is like, you know, how big of a check is big enough that you need to show them this level of organization, organization and coordination? Um, I don't know if there's necessarily like a, a level of check that makes it a requirement. I'd say that it's sort of like, um, there's a lot of reasons for people to say no to investing. And, you know, this just removes one of those um, ways to say no. And so it just helps increase the, the pool of potential investors. That'd be like, it's, it's like having a better deck as opposed to a less good deck. Like, no, it doesn't, you don't need a- <laughs> How good of a deck, deck do I need to raise 500K versus 5 million? You, know, you, you need a good deck for both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and you could, you can raise with no deck. It just, you know, might turn off some people. So. Okay. I would like to share the questions that are being asked in the chat because we have a live audience too. You know, I'm sure the live stream's packed right now. People will be watching this for ages. So Jesse asked a great question, which is um, at what point do I need to build out corporate bylaws? And Brendan with a beautiful dodge says you should ask a lawyer that question. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I don't think there's like a legal requirement. To, to do it when you incorporate, but you know, it's probably a better practice to have bylaws in place. Yeah. Um, honestly, when you incorporate though, most lawyers will tell you like, here's kind of like a cookie cutter list of, of basic bylaws that you could start with. You know, even, even basically from day one as part of the incorporation process, which, you know, might not be a bad place to just kind of start. And then you can always update them yeah. you know, as, as you grow and realize what you need. Any, any thoughts on that, Tim? You said, so? Further thoughts? I, I can, I've invested in like two dozen companies. I don't think I've looked at any single one of their bylaws. So <laughs> that is, that's most investors are probably gonna be like, do bylaws exist? Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, unless there's something really funny in the bylaw. Um, I don't think I've even looked at startup TNT's bylaws. Uh, I, <laughs> let's change this. <laughs> um, okay, here, let's, let's go through this, uh, this overview. Um, you know, we don't have time to go through everything point by point here, but like you got the overview here, you got your investor presentation. That makes a lot of sense to me. That's kind of be like an overview of your business plan. You also have a forecast model and a use of proceeds forecast. Maybe just what's the difference between those two? Uh, one's really deal specific. So like it, in an ideal world, your forecast model, at least the way that we tend to do it is like a monthly forecast you know you like you know you're gonna raise a million bucks we're gonna hire on some staff we're gonna get some revenue but it's like a continuous for the next you know three years or five years or whatever the forecast is in terms of timeline but it rolls into the next phrase and the next phrase and it, it's just sort of painting this like big picture of growth the this like use of proceeds forecast would be like you know we're raising a million bucks we're gonna hire these four people or whatever we're going to you know, develop these things. Here's the milestones we're going to hit. And we're going to spend that million dollars on these categories in order to get to these milestones. And it just like makes it this nice little box around this specific raise. Yeah. Do you, uh, Brandon, any, Brandon, anything else to add there on the forecast and the use of for proceeds forecast? No. I, oh, when I look at stuff as an investor, I like to know where my investment's going to be deployed in the business. And so I think just being explicit about like whether this is going to more product development to get your product to X or it's going towards marketing, just, you know, I think really making it obvious like where you're investing that money in the business, I think is important. Yeah. You've thought through how you're gonna spend the money and you know, what KPIs you're gonna hit, what new revenue target you're gonna hit or what new, you know, product development time target you're gonna hit. Uh, really important, I think, to, to make sure that that's clear and thought out. I, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that are still thinking through, and like that's just the natural state of things when you participate with us at TNT that you're still early and thinking through things. But um, the companies that have like fully thought it through and are making a convincing case seem to do the best in my opinion. Any yeah, it's super that? important. Yeah, I'm looking for a million dollars. I don't know what I'm going to spend it on. Probably not going to do too well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how much money I need. I'm not sure what I would spend it on. Well, okay, well, we should answer those two questions first before we proceed. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, forecast model. You know, this one is actually always a challenge for me. How, how far into the future should we be forecasting? What level of detail do we need in our forecast model? Um, this is forecasting how we're going to spend money and how much money we're going to make, right? We're talking financial forecast. Yeah, financial forecast. I, 
I don't know. My personal opinion is that, you know, the next from a resolution perspective. Um, okay. So two things, one, from a storytelling perspective, you want it to be far enough into the future that you're doing the, like, we're making lots of money and look at how big it's going part of the forecast. But from a resolution perspective, the level of resolution that far out is like, you're making it up. It's a story that you've turned into numbers, but from a resolution perspective, the, the kind of, this raise part, and this is how it ties into the use of proceeds forecast. Like you should know who you're going to be hiring, how much they're going to cost. You're going to have space. You're going to have marketing. You're going to have, you know, whatever you're planning on spending this million dollars on. You should have a decent amount of resolution on timing and, and how, and the quantum um, for that. Yeah, this, that's a good point. You know, a lot of, a lot of times when you're raising money, you're thinking in terms of 12 to 24 months. And, you know, I'm not going to be necessarily profitable and sustainable at that time, but I'm, I'm going to hit key milestones that now let me raise a bigger round to grow even bigger. And so I think, yeah, having the detailed plan for the next, for the, for the period of the raise is going to be very important. It's also, it's also important once you've actually raised the money, <clears throat> typically you'll have like board observers or reporting requirements that would require you to have a budget in place. And so having that information up front, I think is good um, because, you know, that, that will drive, um, you know, your reporting and, and what you do over the next, you know, however long, like 18 months, 24 months. And so, you know, I think the model is an important aspect to run the business and, you know, then it's an important aspect to communicate the financial plan. Yeah. And from the, you know, it's also a storytelling thing, right? Just like the data room is to show that you're, show that you're organized and have thought things through. Um, so you can convert the story into numbers. And when you're looking for numbers, it's important. Um, okay, last point. On, last uh, point on uh, item one here in the overview are the deal documents. So walk us through what are the deal documents? What are the key ones? Mm, super depends on the deal. Um, like if it's a safe, it's a it's one document. It's simple by definition. Um, if there's uh, if it's if it's a priced equity round, then there's you know a, a shareholders agreement, a sub doc, typically. Uh, but at the very least, what I would say is that there's probably a term sheet um, where you're doing a high level summary of you know, we'll call it the, the valuation of the round, how much you're raising, you know, what the minimum maximum check sizes are, you know, the various, various terms that are, that are important. Um, if it's a convertible or a safe, the discount and the interest rate and term and all that type of stuff. Um, just summarizing that for the investors so they can, you know, quickly look at this folder, see the deck, see the model, how much you're looking to raise and what you're going to spend it on. And then, all right, what am I going to get for my money? And that's, that's what this folder is all about. And if, if people on the call don't know what a term sheet is, it's typically like, you know, you'd have your subscription document, but it's like a one to two page highlight sheet of the terms of the investment that you're looking for. Yeah. And then the, the actual subscri subscription agreement, agreement can be a few pages long. Like I think they can be like 20 pages long sometimes. So, yeah, probably. definitely. Or longer. Yeah. Um, okay. Any, um, I've asked this question and I'm not sure what the answer is. So you guys are going to inform me. Are there standardized forms and templates people can use for their deal documents or is everything needs to be customized for that deal? And so I actually just linked in the chat um, an example term sheet from YC. I'd say that YC is probably the standard for, for a few of the things, especially on the safe uh, side of the world. Um, reinventing the wheel for, you know, spending, spending 30 grand on a lawyer to raise 500 or a mil is probably not the best use of cash. Um, they're simple documents for a reason that exists. Um, but then again, every deal is different. So maybe there's a, maybe there's a reason for things to be bespoke, but. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Safe agreements are pretty standard. In fact, um, I know I've talked to a lot of people from the U S that tell me they only sign a safe agreement. Is it, if it is like word for word, the safe agreement from Y Combinator, where it says at the top, this has not been modified. Um, and now Y Combinator has produced a few documents specific to uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, like the post money safe for Canada. Yeah. There's like a post money safe for Canada now. So encourage people to check out the Y Combinator resources. Uh, if we're going to use safe notes, which I am not opposed to for the record, uh, we've signed a number of safe notes at TNT. Um, you know, I, I do encourage us to try and adopt the highest standards set by, uh, set by Y Combinator. You know, they've got a lot of data. I would also maybe qualify all of this with like, you know, it's still important to include your advisors when you're doing this, yeah. you know, don't just send out, you know, standardized documents without having someone reviewing it with you, you know, your accountant and your lawyer, I think is an important aspect to this, especially if you're raising a substantial amount of money. 
Yeah. Or, or if you have other people sitting around the table, like other people that have invested, or you have like, you know, some nuances that are on the cap table that, that uh, need some love. So. Definitely. Okay, guys, let's move on to item two, financial documents. Okay. And um, there is one red item. Why don't we do the red item first? Must have budget for rest of year. This comes back to what I was saying earlier, Zach, about, you know, this is probably a bit of a governance item that some some folks will ask and require if they participate in your RAM. Um, I think just even for yourself, like as a, as a founder or someone in an organization, you probably want to understand uh, your budget for, for the next 12 months so that you understand your cash burn. Um, so I think that kind of comes out of the model um, and it's an important aspect to, to sort of planning your activities. Yeah. Okay. And then item one there, annual financials for the last five years. A lot of our companies are less than five years old that are raising money today, probably on the call here. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be five years, but I think if, if your company is a year old, provide your financial statements that your accountant had prepared uh, for the last year. And um, what are, what are the key financial statements documents? Uh, like, just if you have, if your accounting firm has prepared like notice to reader statements, uh, you know, balance sheet, cash flow statement, profit loss, um, you know, that would be, you know, those would be the three. Um, and then if, you know, interim financial statements are obviously what you've done in the period between your year end and, um, you know, and whenever you're sort of raising or, you know, if your year ends January, uh, provide your statements up to June if you have them. Do do the statements have to be audited or, or at what point would you decide to start audit, getting having audited statements produced? So by way of example, there's a company that um, we're chatting with here in Edmonton that just raised a pretty significant um, series A round. So now they have some pretty legit um, VCs that are sitting around the table and whatnot. They're going through their first audit. Um, they will be at the end of this, at the end of their fiscal year here up until then they've been doing just notice to reader or reviewed financials. So the level of um, the whole point of an auditor or, you know, any of these accounting firms beyond just making sure that your books are good are to make sure that, you know, you're reporting things accurately to people who don't have their fingers in the pie on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, that level of scrutiny increases as there's more and more sophisticated people with more cash around the table. At this point, assuming that, you know, we're not talking to that company, I would say that like, you know, if you're raising 500 a mil, two mil, like you're not at the point where you need audited numbers. And, and this is actually an interesting question for another reason. I think that sometimes investors will come in and um, require or ask to do a different level of assurance. Um, I've, I mean, me personally, I've always pushed back and, and pushed for notice to readers because they're more cost effective. But, you know, sometimes investors coming in might ask for, you know, as a minimum standard review level engagements um, be done at the end of the year. And so this is something you could watch out for when you're raising money. It might be a term that uh, folks would want to see. And who do, do companies need to work with a professional to prepare these financial statements or can they do it themselves? I mean, the, the external assurance is from an external firm, like a CPA or something that signs off on like, yes, these are all legit numbers. Um, but if you just like this, this isn't a hand, hand a box to KRP exercise and like here, <laughs> you're all pick it up. Um, you know, you have, you, you should be building your financials on, internally on a regular basis for a whole host of reasons. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, like in an ideal world, you'll have built the financials and then they won't change anything and they'll sign off on them. Um, granted, that isn't usually the case, but that's an ideal world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, if anybody wants to talk to an accountant, we do have great friends in KRP that work with a lot of companies. So um, that was not my goal. <laughs> um, all right. You guys want to move on to, to item 2.4, tax returns. Um, anything to share? Well, tax returns, I guess those are relatively self-explanatory. Shred. Yeah. I mean, keep them in there. Yeah. Making sure that they're done. And then, you know, um, it's mostly a, like most of this is just confirmatory diligence, like making sure that it's done, making sure that like at a glance, it seems like it's done right. And then you're saying that you're getting shred. So let's see that you've actually gotten shred um, and that it actually seems like it passes a smell check because there's a, you know, if you file it wrong, there's some issues in having to repay things and stuff like that. So. I'm guessing that items 2.5 through 2.9, a lot of people don't know. So why don't we just do a little rapid fire here? What are these things? What is AR aging? Uh, accounts receivable. So it'd be receivables that you have um, outstanding from 
Pr probably mostly trade credit, like from your customers typically. And aging, when you say aging, what does that mean? Uh, it'd be like a summary of what's owed to you. So it'd be like a table. You'd have like customers on one axis, timeline on the other. It's like, oh, this okay. so it's, it's like a detail. It's not just like AR is worth $30,000. It's like, this is specifically what's owed to us. Yeah. Okay. And like, I guess for clarity here, like if you're, if you're a hardware company that's done $2 million and your accounts receivable is like 500,000, this is probably an item that you want to, you know, you want to show. If you're a SaaS business that has like a couple thousand dollars in accounts receivable, like you don't need to show an AR aging summary. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, you know, this is where your judgment comes into play when you're building out the room. Like this is essentially, it's the, these 2.5 through 2.9 are essentially like, if there's any weird things, this is specifically balance sheet. Um, if there's any significant items on the balance sheet, um, then you should probably list them in a little bit more detail. You know, you have like 500K that you owe to somebody on accounts payable. It's like, what is that? What's going on here? Like, <laughs> you know, somebody who's putting in a whole bunch of cash is going to want to know where their money's going to be going. So, or inventory detail. Yeah. Do you have any examples where, like, yeah, inventory detail was a key one we had to look at it? Uh, or what type of business would have that? The hardware company that Brendan's referencing <laughs> would be one. Um, another one, like a, a luxury footwear company that we work with, is probably relevant from a footwear per, or from an inventory perspective. Like, there, where there's significant dollars that are sitting on the balance sheet. Um, you know, again, if you're a SaaS company, balance sheet is essentially, we lose lots of money until we eventually make it. So we have some accounts receivable and some deferred revenue, but broadly it's not really relevant. So. Yeah. And so then maybe I'm getting these, you know, fixed asset register. What is that? Like, I'm thinking like cash register with fixed yeah. assets on it or something. But it's like, it'd be like capital equipment, <laughs> leasehold improvements. Capital um, expenditures. Yeah, yeah, capital expenditures. Things that you own, yeah. Yeah. Okay. software possibly um but yeah and i think quinn makes a good point here like a lot of times don't these ones really matter when you're borrowing from the bank um they also they also matter from an equity perspective if if you if you're coming if someone's coming in with an equity investment and these are substantial items if they're not substantial items that's why we put them as a priority three um you know for early stage companies there's largely none of this stuff will be relevant so you know obviously this is again this is comes back to your judgment you, you decide whether you think this is important to you and someone might ask you for it and just be prepared to have it yeah okay great thank you quinn for that insight and a great point uh, okay do you guys want to move on to corporate documents item three let's get it going um, so let's let's kick it off in here. We know what are the corporate documents? Oh, what are we looking for in here? Um, <laughs> mostly to make sure that you actually have a company, and then also to see who else is sitting around the table and who we're getting into bed with. That's most of what this is. So articles of incorporation is basically just confirming that you actually incorporated legally. And that's just the documents demonstrate that you did that. Yeah, it's not that hard to come up with a subscription agreement ship it over and be like, yeah, company ABC. I'm like, okay, well, do you actually own company ABC? That feels relevant. Yeah. Um, so here, here, I'm going to ask this question, which is kind of a practical one I've heard people bring up, which is why would I incorporate federally versus incorporating in Alberta? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? This is like a question that's probably like highly dependent on the company. Um, like, I don't know, it's like you can't really answer that question, Zach. You can't answer that question. Okay, it's too difficult. It's company specific. It, uh, if you're more specific, there's probably like tax reasons why you'd maybe do that. Um, but I don't know. I have literally no idea. I'm not even going to hazard a guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's actually, I think it's quite rare for companies to incorporate federally. Um, I'm not sure why, but most companies incorporate in the province, like the, the, where they're headquartered, from my experience. Uh, but a lawyer would be better uh, suited to answer that question. Someone asked, um, I think Jess asked something about a person if they're if a, if it's like a closely held corporation. I believe is what if it's a sole shareholder. So the corporation is owned by one person. There's only one shareholder. Do they? Yeah, you should you should you should still maintain a minute book. I think it's okay. it's good practice. Um, you know, and there's lots of stuff that would go in a minute book, like you know when you declare dividends, you still you still have some like legal requirement. Um, you know, you have to think about like your company is separate from you as a, as a person, and I think making sure that you're maintaining those documents is, is good practice. I've seen some companies who've come through, they, you know, they decide, you know, two or three years down the line that they want to raise money. And then all of those documents are a mess. 
Um, their minute book's not up to date. And now all of a sudden you have to go back and try to recreate some of these things, um, which becomes costly and expensive if you just keep them up on a regular basis. Um, keep up your reg corporate registration. Those are all important things when you're, um, you know, when, when you're incorporated. Basic stuff. Um, a lot of lawyers will-, will Yeah, director's resolutions, th those types of things. I think even if you're a sole shareholder of a closely held company, you should do all of that stuff on an annual basis. Yeah. So do you advise that companies just like basically have a lawyer on, on contract that makes sure that all this stuff is in order? Or is this something that you, they can kind of update to themselves? Or do you uh, these like table stakes things are super cheap for a lawyer to do. And then they're like 100% done. I mean, you can probably figure it out yourself. It's not really that hard to Google stuff, but for like a thousand bucks or whatever you can get or 500 bucks or whatever, you can get a lawyer to do this like easy, easy minute book stuff. Cause it's, I mean, it's easy lead generation for them. And then it's sort of, you haven't, they've have built a relationship and then they get the more expensive work down the line. Right. So, um, you know, we have, a, we have a few folks, you know, in Edmonton, I probably see that Craig at Kingsgate, um, there's some folks in Calgary and then, in you know, I know there's just uh, Saskatchewan people on the line. So Joe, over at McCurcher is also quite good, you know, all super inexpensive to be able to do this sort of table stake stuff just to make sure that things are right uh, when you're going for investment. Yeah, there's someone in the chat says that they do some of these documents themselves. So, uh, you know, there's there's choices out there, but these are important documents. So you don't want to get them wrong. You know, you don't want to mess this up. Um, okay, restricted share agreements, voting trust agreements. What are those? What's a restricted share agreement? Brennan, you're on you, uh, I mean, restricted shares have certain restrictions on them. Um, you know, sometimes they're issued to founders or co-founders or other important people in the organization that um, Is this... that are that are part of the early team. And okay. these are just the agreements that you would have signed from those folks. Um, these are different from like preferred preferred shares. Yeah. So like. Um... You know, on a if you're doing an earnout, like if you have an employee, um, say you're a founding employee and you get a whole bunch of shares, um, sometimes you'll do a restricted share agreement where they're restricted from, you know, if you leave, then you get like those clawed back or whatever. There's like a you can place agreements around equity um, right. that are relevant and highly company specific. So right, right. if you have them, you'll know about them. If you don't, then you don't have them. <laughs> Uh, voting trust agreements. What are those for? Uh, like if you've, if you're, uh, if you, if you have the ability to vote on behalf of other shareholders and stuff like that, like if you've pulled, if you've pulled their voting rights to be for you instead of for them. Okay. Um, the corporate org chart, this is actually feels important when you guys put this under corporate documents. Uh, what are you guys looking for here when you see someone's corporate org chart? This isn't, so this, this isn't employees. This is the, like the legal entities. So you know, if you have a subsidiary in the US or the UK or something like that, I mean, if there's multiple companies, like you have your IP in one company and an operating company and a parent company, which one's being invested in and stuff like that, who owns what, how much is owned by whatever. That's right. the, that's how this goes. Okay. And we do, we do meet companies like that sometimes. Some of you have, you know, agreements and relationships with other entities. So, sorry, I had that wrong. It's corporate org chart, not uh, yeah. a management org chart mm -hmm. here. Yeah, it's basically just like a diagram of all the companies and their ownership. The people on the call are wondering how the hell Zach Storm's like, is an investor you can't answer basic questions. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's why there's there's guys like Tim that understand this far better than, than and, most of us. And, and Brendan. <laughs> okay, the unanimous shareholders agreement. This, I've always heard, is a very important one. You, what, what's your opinion on the importance of this one? I think it... So we were actually... Was this yesterday that we were chatting about this with uh, with some of the yeah, folks? We were just talking about this earlier this week with the investors. Yeah, so um, it's it's an important document. Um, so if somebody is investing as equity and they're going to be signing the unanimous shareholder agreement and becoming a party to it, it's super relevant. Like you definitely need that because they're going to be signing that document. Um, there's a whole bunch of terms in there. We don't necessarily need to get into it right now. You could probably have a whole 60 minute conversation on what you need in a USA. Yeah. Um, if somebody's investing as a, you know, on a say for a convertible note, they're not a party to it until that, um, until that converts to equity, which will happen at the next round. 
And the relevant thing and why I referenced yesterday was that what we were talking about yesterday was that on the next round, these documents change almost entirely. And so um, depending on whether this is a, a, you know, an equity investment or a, or a convertible or, or safe investment, um, if it's convertible or safe, you're mostly just looking for red flags as an investor. Like if people have put things in there that are just like, they just flag weird, strange governance things like, you know, all power being to one person or like, you just like signif you know, signals craziness. Um, but otherwise you're not a party to this. It doesn't really matter. But Tim, would you say that, you know, if you, if you have like a founder team of three, for example, and you're all, let's call it a third, a third, a third, I think having a shareholders agreement in place, maybe not on day one, but certainly like at some point, um, you know, it helps, it helps with the question around like what happens if someone passes away or gets critically injured or, or, or quits or quits, which we've yeah. seen a couple times. Yeah. You know, and what's the mechanism to have that person exit um, yeah. the organization. And I think it's an important thing to be able to, to look to that, to guide, you know, what happens in those instances. And, and then it also looks to guide, you know, the question around valuation, you know, at that point in time. And so I think, you know, this is an important document both externally when you're raising money, if it's, if it's equity to Tim's point, but it's also an important document uh, internally, if you have a founder team that, um, you know, where you have a founder team, I think. hundred mm, percent, totally agree. And then I think the final one on here that we haven't discussed yet is the subscription agreements for all current screen holders. So that's everyone else who's already a, a shareholder in the company or is participating in this current round, the previous rounds. Everything. Yes, I mean, the, the very next line is cap table. So um, <clears throat> 3.8 would be like, you know, maybe it's the um, standard form for each of the rounds that you've done or, or, you know, you actually have the employees that have signed equity agreements. Because very often you'll just have like, yeah, we agreed that each of us have, and Gina, we'll get to your point, um, you know, each of us have a third or somebody has half and two other people have a quarter or, or whatever, and you kind of handshake it. This kind of ties into the minute book, making sure that things are actually registered, things have actually been issued. Um, the documents actually exist. We check to make sure that there isn't any weird terms that are going to blow us up on the next round or down the line. Um, you know, just making sure that things are things are all tickety boo. Um, Gino Brendan asked. Uh, Brendan Gino asked, would one founder holding fifty one percent and in a team of three or more be a red flag? Uh, I don't think so. Doesn't um, feel like a red flag to me. No, it's like you know, I don't think there's any uh, one formula for like teams. Like it, it's all no, definitely one founder not. owns a larger percentage of the company than others. That's pretty yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's considerations that are non-investment considerations that, like, if, if me as an investor seeing that, I don't think it's necessarily a red flag. If you know, if it's an early stage investment, um, probably doesn't matter all that much. But um, but internally, there might again. This comes back to like internally. The team of three, you know, there are, you know, there are certain rules around um, voting structures and whatnot that um, might come into play, just depending on who owns what within the organization. And these are more like legal questions than, you know, sort of finance and accounting ones, but um, so, something to keep in mind. From, from a diligence perspective, I mean, you'll always get, you'll, the, your, inve your investor will always be trying to figure out, make sure that the team is, is legit um, and solid together. And a huge component of that is going to be, you know, equity compensation and buy-in and, and whether everybody's fine there. And so it, no matter whether it's, you know, it could be 99% and 1% all the way to equal splits. Like the question is going to come up, how do you guys figure this out? Um, you know, does it work? Like all that type of stuff. Um, so, and then 4.2 is ESOP. So that's the other side. So, yeah. Yeah, and I might make one, one comment or observation that uh, the more people that are founders and equity holders from the get-go, the more likely, like just like statistically, the more likely that one of them might end up leaving early or there could be a, there could be a challenge. So that just makes these documents even more important at that point. Yeah, 100%, Zach. Exactly. Like you, yeah. if, you, if you, it's already an emotional thing when someone leaves. And then if you don't have these constating documents in place and they're done properly, then it becomes both an emotional problem, but also a potentially big financial one. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's like, I think this is where we're getting like really good legal advice and getting good um, advice from your advisors is really helpful. 
Yeah. yeah. I, can, I can tell you from personal experience, I've been I'm part of a startup where we had like agreements like this and I actually ended up leaving early and we just basically followed the rules of the agreement and I was happy and they were happy and it wasn't a big deal. So, you know, it's important to agree to these things up front. Uh, that's that's all, all legal documents are is agreement, agreeing to a whole bunch of super nuanced things up front so that you like preempt a whole bunch of issues down the line. It's just, it's just like future relationship insurance. That's yeah. And it, it can be a little daunting to think it through the lawyer and, you know, be careful because depending on the lawyer, they're going to pay you for all that time that you're thinking it through. So yeah, you could, you could think through it to the end of the earth and have a 500 page document that you've paid your entire round of money to. So <laughs> waste of time too. Now you don't even have a company. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about these financing documents. These are very important. Let's start with very number one, cap table. What is the cap table? Shorthand for something. Capitalization table. It's essentially a, it's literally a, a like a 2D table um, that has on one axis, you know, names of people or, you know, itemized people. And then on the other one, you know, how much invested into what security class, when they did it, that type of thing. Um, it can get more detailed than that. And it probably should be a little bit more detailed than that. But broadly, who owns what, how much, and what's going on with the ownership of the company? Who owns what? It would also include probably employee stock options, which is item number two on the cap table. Like how many employee stock options are there? Depending, depending if you've, like sometimes folks or groups going through their first raise haven't um, put an ESOP plan in place. But this is a this is an area that you know as you're raising money, especially beyond your first friends and family round. Maybe you're raising your first million, and you're like, "Oh, I want to be able to attract and retain um, key employees in my company." You you know, this is something that you'd want to talk to your potential investors about, saying, "I want to set aside five percent or ten percent or whatever makes sense for your organization." Um, you know, maybe you don't have that ESOP agreement in place, but you know, showing that you have sort of a plan to do that, I think, is important. And if you do have it in place, then this is the place to put it. Yeah. And, you know, I want to share the feedback on the ESOP that we just got from someone else we were speaking to at an earlier event, which was, you know, there might be like rules of thumb out there where like it's roughly 10% of the shares, but, you know, their suggestion was like, think through your company and realistically, like how much of your shares would you have to give away? You know, if, if you're structuring your, your compensation package to get like a killer employee, maybe you need to give away a little bit more to ensure that like that person has ownership because you can't. Yeah. And the other thing that I've seen floating around on a number of occasions now is bringing advisors on. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of it, there's a few advisors, at least I've seen the same agreement a few times now. I think it's a Y Combinator agreement. Um, and those advisors also would like a piece of the equity. And so, you know, I think just making sure that you know, you're planning for key hires, planning for advisors um, are, is an important aspect to, to the ESOP. And, and, it, and this ties into um, up at the beginning, we were kind of chatting about um, that, you know, you're going to raise this much as what you're going to spend it on. You're going to be hiring people with the cash. Usually that's what you're doing when you're growing a startup. A part of it is you're going to need to, you know, attract them with equity and cash compensation. And so, you know, there's some blend of that. You can tilt towards less cash, more equity, but then you're going to need to have it allocated in the ESOP here or, or vice versa, and then you need to raise more. So just having thought through all of it and making sure that it ties is part of how to be really organized. Yeah. And, well, I, want and pause, I want to pause for a moment and observe that we're now at 38 participants. We've increased by four. I have no idea how this is interesting to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think, Zach, the other thing that I've seen a couple of times on, on the ESOP is depending on the investor and it depends on how sophisticated the investor is, but some of the investors actually want to know which roles you think you're going to need to grant the ESOP to. And so there is this, you know, Hey, we've allocated 10% of the equity. Um, and then they want to know kind of even deeper than that, what roles those are going to be used to fill. Um, and so, you know, just thinking through a bit of a plan there, I think is important. Yeah. It's, it's helpful for you personally to think that through. Um, yeah, there's so a whole bunch of considerations around ESOP that I think we could, we, again, we could do another hour session, I think, just on well, ESOP alone, but, I, um, but yeah. I was actually going to ask you guys, do you have any resources for the cap table on the ESOP that you can recommend, uh, sample cap tables or? We should, prob <clears throat> we should probably put some stuff up on TNT like this, like we should do this stuff on our blog. Um, we just haven't done it yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have a cap table that's online somewhere that we can point people to. Um, 
Someone I'll, actually, I'll, I'll find one. Somebody pointed one in our, someone, in pointed, our, someone shared one in our Slack channel, Tim. See if you can find that one. Yeah, I'll figure out where it was. Okay, all documentation around warrants and warrant holders. Let's back up for a second. Some of us don't know what a warrant is, like warrant for arrest. I kind of know what that is. Is this something similar? Warrant to buy a stock. Yeah, it's like, it's the right to purchase a company's stock at like a specific price. Um, it's a little different than an option. An option is you have the option to buy uh, um, at, at a certain strike price. And Tim, Tim will be able to articulate this probably better than me because he's a corporate finance guy through and through. So maybe I'll let him take this one. I was looking, we're asking about warrants? Yeah. Warrants are options that are issued by the company. So, I mean, ESOP, like the options for, a, for an employee are technically their warrants. Um, if it's an op, like if it's traded between, you know, if me and Zach are investors um, and I buy an option from Zach, then it's an option. If I buy it from the company, then it's a warrant. Otherwise, oh, okay. This is an important distinction. I don't think I even realized that. Okay. The company issues warrants. It's like, it's like all, you know, all rectangles uh, or all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles. Yeah. Are but if, if you're, if you're buying and trading on the, uh, on the stock market, then it's options. Yeah. Like a trading among like a warrant is a warrant is a special option. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, okay. And so we, we why do people use warrants? Maybe just like a little education here. Why why are companies issuing warrants? Why do people request a warrant? What's it giving you the right to do? I've seen it a couple of times, Zach, where it's like uh, you know, they've issued, let's say, a million dollars worth of debt. Um, and as a sweetener to that debt, they'll be like, you know, let's say the sh they anticipate the shares at the end of the year to be $3, they'll issue warrants that expire at the end of the year alongside that debt at $2. And so you're getting a bit of a sweetener on um, investing in that debt instrument, for example. So, you know, if at the end of the year you get there and you're like, oh, you know, they've performed, they've outperformed and maybe they're, we think their share price is actually 350, you can buy shares at $2 at the end of the year, but they expire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you don't execute you're right under the warrant agreement, then that goes away. Mm -hmm. um, I've invested in a couple of things that are directionally similar to that exact scenario. And so that's, that's, a, that's a time that you would use warrants um, potentially. I got, I got Tony Briggs is direct messaging me. Even, we even got the professor of TNT showing up here. <laughs> I haven't seen Tony in a long time. I, uh, Weighing in on warrants? I, I, so I have a couple of points on, on warrants. So we've seen... I've seen two of these. Um, one, so ZS2, when we invested in them back in the clean tech summit, uh, we invested and we got, um, essentially we got one share and one half of a warrant that expires a year after uh, the issuance. Um, so that invest, like it's essentially, it's, you know, as an investor, we want you to work with us over the next year to help grow the company. And then you're enticed to, to buy, essentially you're, you're re-upping your investment. Um, you're getting in, you have to buy another 50% of the, of what you originally bought. So you bought a hundred thousand dollars, you had a warrant to buy another 50,000 at that same price a year from there. So it's like an interesting way in order to get investors around the table to be pretty excited about the company. And the other one, and this one's pretty common is in venture debt, which is a little bit later stage. Um, but you raise, you know, say 4 million bucks. You can typically, you can go to like RBC or Silicon Valley bank or, or whatever, um, and get debt a debt instrument to essentially extend your runway. But part of that debt instrument is they'll get warrants as well. Um, again, as Brendan was alluding to, to sweeten the, essentially they get ownership alongside you um, so that there, there's a kicker for performance on, on the company. Okay, thank you. Any, that was actually a good conversation on warrants. I personally learned a lot. Um, it's always good to get educated by your friends at Startup TNT. Um, what about security interests registered against the company? Is this different from debt? What is this? Uh, it's could a little be. bit, it could be, it could be debt, but it could be a little bit broader. Um, like there's one, uh, one of the companies that we've invested in has a, uh, is a revenue based financing. So they raised, um, they raised like, I don't know, call it a hundred grand. And they told people um, that they'll pay them back uh, as a, a percentage of revenue. As they get revenue in the door, it'll just get carried off. Um, to pay those people down up to 10x of what they invested, um, which 
kind of shows up as debt, but it's more broadly, it's just any sort of security interest against the company that doesn't necessarily show up as a traditional thing on the balance sheet. And, and for people that don't understand what security interest means, it's like you can have specific security against, let's call it a piece of equipment within the business. Maybe you, maybe you had a, a lender lend you money against that specific piece of equipment and they would register uh, security interest against that. There's a blanket one called the general security agreement that might be registered against the entire company. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is, you know, just awesome. provide awesome. those documents to that effect. For IP as well, sometimes there's yeah. security against IP. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the debt financing arrangements. So I guess that one's maybe a little more, that's more traditional debt loans. This, on this one's loans. more talking about what are the particulars of those debt instruments, you know, like you have, you know, it might not show up on the balance sheet because you haven't drawn on it. So say, for example, you have a $500,000 line of credit that you've never borrowed against, um, but it's there. It's actually kind of helpful to the company. And so just like sharing those documents, what is it, what's going on? That's the, that's it. Okay. And then the last one is grant financing arrangements. Yeah. This is probably very, uh, like, this is probably very, uh, relevant to the conversation here. Cause I think a lot of companies will have, um, you know, grant financing arrangements in place. And so I think, you know, just what I, I mean, Tim, this comes back to like a lot of times we've seen due diligence room, they'll just dump all of the documents in. And maybe this is a good time to talk about like summarizing some of this stuff. So if you have like three or four grant fund funding arrangements, putting a summary sheet together, that's like, uh, you know, a table or something like that just summarizes what those grant funding arrangements are is sometimes super helpful. Put that in here and then have the actual agreements in behind. Um, and there's probably, you could probably do this across the board on some of this stuff. So if there's like a whole bunch of documents, just summarize them in, you know, one summary and then just have the documents in behind. Um, I think it's, is really helpful. And I'm not sure if Tim has any other feedback on grant financing arrangements or not. Yeah, the particulars and what you're looking for on a grant financing arrangement is like what happens if you don't perform on something or what are the specific things that the grant was for and when can they claw that money back or, you know, maybe they get to take some IP with them or like there's like sometimes there's some weird stuff that happens with grants that you're essentially making a trade with them um, to do stuff. So Yeah, I've seen a couple of times too in grant financing arrangements that, you know, grant financing, financing has been given, but there's like a royalty component to it. And I think as founders, make sure that you're reading the documents, make sure you understand the stacking limits, make sure you understand the responsibilities you have around taking grant funding, um, because it, I think it's an important aspect to, to the business. Just make sure you're reading the, the agreements. Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of reporting requirements and usually there's a matching requirement. Almost always. Some yeah, matching requirement, yeah. It's, I mean, the reporting and applying for grant funding, I, I've heard it described as like, the cost of capital, you know, the typically grant funding is, you know, either interest-free loans or, uh, you know, just actual cash that uh, folks are providing you and, and doing all of the reporting and, and whatnot is just the cost of, of getting that money in the door. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Um, yeah, you know, I want to ask this question to you too, because it comes up sometimes, you know, do people look down upon companies that are receiving grants, like they should just be going after private funding? response i i don't think so like i mean there's a balance right like it's kind of like you know our companies that go and win a pitch competition is that a bad thing like no it's kind of neat actually to get yourself on the stage but if that's all you do then yeah. you're probably not helpful yeah so, Zach, i've seen i've seen it in uh one scenario where it actually helped close around so we had you know a big block of non-dilutive funding coming in and we needed matching money and the matching money and the grant or the, the low interest loan or the zero interest loan helped us uh, close the, the actual dilutive funding. Nice. And so I think it can be a really powerful way to raise money if you're like, hey, you know what? I, I have $500,000 in non-dilutive money sitting on my door and I need 500,000 from the investment community to close the loop on all of that. Really you know, it, 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 I think from my perspective as an investor, it kind of de-risks a little bit, right? Um, and it's non-dilutive for everybody. So it's, it can be very, very helpful. Um, but I think to Tim's point, if all you're doing is going after grant money, I think, you know, you're, you're probably chasing the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, you still have to build the business and make it commercially successful. 
Yeah, good comments. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with going after grant money, but uh, I do think Tim's right. You gotta be careful if that's all you're getting. Um, I actually wanted to give a shout out to our friends at SDTC um, that have a really awesome grant program that is, uh, I think, one of the most flexible grants out there that is a matching program to angel investing, where basically they're, they're kind of like coming in as granting body going along in an angel round, and they'll match the angel round up to a certain amount. Is that the seed fund one, Zach? I forget. They have a couple. I think one of them goes up to $100,000. and one of them That's the seed larger. fund. Yeah. So that, that's a pretty cool one where it's, it's focused on clean tech, but you know, I'd be curious to see how, how, what kind of outcomes they're getting and I encourage anyone else from the granting body sector to maybe look at that as a model for, for other sectors beyond clean tech. I, the, the seed fund I, that's- I don't know why it's just a clean tech space that everyone can benefit from a grant like that. The seed fund one is by far the, I, w- I don't wanna say it's, it's the lightest touch on the application. They've, I think they've kind of nailed that grant in particular, like it's, it's really founder friendly. It's, it's easy to apply for. Um, yeah, they've made a, they've done a really good job on it for sure. Well, awesome. We want to give a shout out to uh, Jonathan Kata from SDTC. who's actually one of our investors down in Calgary. So good job, Jonathan, keep it up. <laughs> we have, how many, I don't know how many sections we have left, but some of these we can just like kind of power through. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say there's a lot of sections on here, but not all of them need to be talked to at great length. Those first um, four are the, are the, the pretty clutch ones. Yeah, like the, the first four have a lot of reds, and they're and they're important. Human resources, um, actually, think I would actually describe this one as, as pretty important as well, especially on the founding team. But yeah, go ahead, guys. In I, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the HR stuff you're going to be talking about, like conversationally with an investor or in your deck or whatever. Um, the really important from a documentation perspective, one is these employment agreements. Um, you know, you have somebody that's working, doesn't have an employment agreement, you build IP, and then you have like, you know, the Zuckerberg, uh, you have the Facebook issue with those Winklevoss twins, right? Uh, they walk away and they say that they own a whole bunch because it wasn't a thing. Um, so you want to get things written down. Organizational chart. This is your org chart that you were talking about earlier, Zach. This is like your the people chart. in the organization, not the corporate structure. Um, and yeah, that, you know, I do think that, you know, my quick comment on this is a lot of companies when they're raising money, even if they're raising 500k to a million might be pretty small. You're like, I'm like a four person team, but probably worthwhile to think about your org chart now and what kind of gaps you, you need to fill in the team. You know? what, what I've seen done really well in, yeah, in a right. couple of scenarios is, and this is, again, this is like a due diligence item, but it's more really for the company. I think like having the org chart today and maybe the prospective one. And how you plan on, you know, I, I think this is part of the entrepreneur. What was that slat or Twitter? EOS. Tweet that, BOS. BOS system. Yeah. Like thinking about like the roles and responsibilities and where those people are going to report to. And I think this is an important one both today and, you know, six months or 12 months from now. Yeah. And like I was saying earlier with the ESOP and this 5.6, you can see half of it, but tying it into, you know, we're going to hire a whole bunch of people. Who are they going to work under? You know, how's this going to all to work together? And then if you scroll down one click on your wheels, Zach, um, yeah, the, you know, ESOP forecast and compensation for those folks, just making sure that it all ties in, you know, across these sections and that it's well, well thought through. Well, you know, if it, if it's, if it's here, here, and here, all this kind of looks the same, smells the same people, be like, oh, these people have thought this through, this is organized. This makes a lot of sense. I can trust them to build this. Yeah. I, I want to specifically call it 5.7 because I think it's a good one. Um, I wouldn't make this like a 10 page bio of every person in the company, but like a quick, um, you know, summary of each person I think is, is relevant. I, I think for the most part, as an investor, I think lots of investors are looking at who they're investing in um, and, and the market opportunity. And, and so this section I think is important from that perspective. Yeah, 5.7, talking about your board directors and advisors. You know, it's actually, like talk about human resources. There's the founders and the key employees. You've also got the directors, advisory board members, and contractors, all of which are going to be an uh, important part of the team. Um, any thoughts on building out your board of directors? You know, that's like kind of a separate thing on its own, but maybe just a comment or a quick thought on, do they need a formal board of directors to raise money as a startup? Um, no, I think that, um, Brendan also shook his head. So no, but um, where I think that having a board is helpful, like it's helpful to just have people around the table from a governance perspective to keep you between the rails. 
Um, it's also helpful to build that cadence um, with a group of relatively friendly folks before you're at the you know, Series A level or, or seed or wherever you start to have a formal board so you can sort of build that cadence of reporting and you know, look sharp. It also gives, um, this is one of the diligence things that pe some people ask for is your past board or management reports um, to see sort of how you've been, you know, how you've been progressing and stuff like that. And so if you're forced to do it, that's helpful. Um, but it doesn't need to be this like scary, oh my God, the board's going to fire me type group of people it should be. It, it can be hard to find your group of the board. So I, you know, I think like using advisors, advisory boards at the beginning, I think those are all great tools or even just like some personal okay. mentors. Like I, I'd be, uh, I'd be careful about building out a formal board before you need one. Programs like the Venture Mentor Service, both in Calgary and Edmonton are, you know, great resources. Stuff like CDL, I think is a great resource. You know, you're probably most closely held companies, their board's going to be their founders. Um, but having a couple advisors, I think that are relevant to your industry uh, are super important. I mean, you, um, don't, you, don't, you never really need a formal board unless there's other, you know, people involved, like other investors involved. Um, there's a company that you know, in my past life that we sold, that was like a $260 million company. They had a board of advisors. because so one guy owned the whole thing. He's like, I don't actually want a board. I'm the board, but I'll have people <laughs> around me that can help me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I think there, I've also, I've also heard this and, you know, you take this with a grain of salt, but I've heard some uh, investors get actually turned off if there's too many advisors. So like, if it's a, you know, if it's Tim and I, and we're, we're shared founders, but we have like a team of 10 advisors, it's probably a red flag that like, Maybe Tim and I just, we're not good at solving problems and we're solely sure. relying on advisors to do the work for us. Or, um, or, or it's just like, a, we're just trying to make ourselves look good instead of actually doing yeah, it. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's probably more likely that one where the advisors are just names there and they're not actually involved at all. Yeah, 100%. And I've seen it where people put a lot of, in, in a couple pitches specifically, I can think back to a few that I've seen. It's like, oh, look at all these great advisors. Look at all these great logos. And it was like almost an oversell. Um, and so I think, yeah, you just be a little bit careful with, with this section for sure. And, and make sure that the people that you're putting in your deck that you're saying that are involved or actually involved. I've had, I've, I've had, I've had one company that put me in their deck. I'm like, we had one conversation. Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. You should always make sure that they're, they're happy to be listed as an advisor. Um, yeah. Okay. I've heard people say that uh, you don't need any board or advisors or anything until you have at least a million dollars in revenue because, uh, but I don't know if that rule of thumb sticks, but okay. Why don't we talk, you know, we, are, we only have 15 minutes left. There's a few other items on here. Let's talk about the product development section. I think that this is actually a pretty important section of a lot of, especially for people that are like more deep tech companies or hardware companies, really anyone. Um, what do we have in here? Description of past spend, how much money they've spent on their product. Talk about this one. So, I mean, you know, presumably if you're raising, you know, from angels or seed or whatever, you'll have raised money in the past and you'll have spent money. So say you've, you know, raised 300K to date. Um, what have you spent it on? Like, is it people? What have they been working on? Like, um, just shows, shows that you've been building stuff. Um, especially if there's like hardware involved, like, you know, the split between various things. It's just an important history lesson to kind of, as an investor showing uh, what management has been paying attention to and, and all that type of stuff. So. Yeah. What have you spent today? What do you spend it on? And then the roadmap. I like, I really like this one. This is an important one because it's often dependent, like your success as a company at this stage is often dependent on your ability to actually build out this product the way that you think it's going to work. So yeah. And what, then, what are you looking for in the roadmap? 6.2 part, like it's a, it's a lot of question marks and it's like kind of intentionally vague because it depends on the company. Like it's a super nuanced thing, depending on what everybody's up to, but um, part of it's going to be answered in the deck. Like if you don't have, if you're a startup, you're building something like this should be a very key part of the deck. It'll obviously also come up in conversation. Um, but what you want to do here is support it with some tangible evidence as to what's going on. Like, you know, we think we're going to be able to sell it for, you know, X per unit because of A, B and C reason. And then we have them in here. We have sort of like, you know, we're going to be working on, here's our product plan. Like if it's a, if you have a platform technology or whatever, and you're going to be developing three or four things, like here's kind of the calendar and what we need to do first. And just kind of showing that you have a plan for product development is, it depends on the stage of the company as well. Like if you're super early, you don't have a manager of product where this is their full-time job or, you know, if you're later than you do. So. Okay. And actually we like the last one you guys have on here, which is the revenue breakdown by brand or product. 
um, yeah. especially if you have multiple <clears throat> ones. Yeah, if you're if you're already generating revenue, you know, it'd be great. Like if you and you have multiple products, it's great to know, you know, what is generating that revenue today. Um, you know, if you're selling into multiple com- countries, this might be an uh, an interesting. Um, you know, breakdown, maybe it's by geography, um, you know, maybe it's by geography today and where you plan on going tomorrow. Um, there's probably a lot of different things you can do with the, the historic revenue breakdown, but, you know, if you have multiple products, I can tell you for sure that, and, you, and you're generating revenue, I can tell you for sure that uh, folks would want to know um, which products are generating the revenue. And and by customer, like depending on if it's, yeah, like, a, like if you're like B2B and you have like some large enterprise folks, um, even if it's a blinded list, like blinded being like customer A, customer B, customer C, as opposed to actual names. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that can be, that can be pretty helpful as well. Cause it's generally a question that can come up. So helpful to be in front yeah. of. It's also just, you know, a really important thing for you to monitor yourself as a company, like mm-hmm. which of my products are making me money. Like, um, like, like, like I said at the beginning, most of this exercise is to communicate to an investor that you're organized and you have your shit together and they should trust you to run their company. That they should trust you to, to take their money and be good stewards of it while you run the company. Um, so yeah, most of this is, oh, this would be really good for like an internal purpose. Like, yeah, that's kind of the point. Um, so this isn't a make work project. So, Well, let's talk about sales and customers then, because I think this is maybe the last really important one that you definitely want to get in there. Um, what your business is nothing about sales and customers. So Pricing strategy. You got you got some sort of like strategy documents up here at the at the, at the top. I've definitely seen strategy. Tim like Tim likes to dig into customer economics, and so I think like the pricing strategy kind of informs the business model. Uh, and so you know there are some investors like Tim who's more of a finance mind. He, he likes to to dig into that and understand like how you think or he thinks the business is going to work. Um, and I, again, it's this is a really important exercise to do internally. I think it's less, it's for investors for sure, but it's more internal dialogue that you want to think about. Like, you know, if your customer acquisition costs is a thousand dollars and the customer lifetime value is 500 bucks, and that's kind of how you're thinking about the business, you're probably going to have a problem um, from a financial perspective. So yeah. thinking through some of these things, I think is an important aspect to, to planning out, um, you know, your business model. And there's no, um, there's no right, answer like especially at you know like we're talking about the talking about the tnt stage of company right so generally you won't have had a whole lot of sales yet you know even if you're at a million of arr in the grand scheme of things it's not a hell of a lot of sales um the whole point of this is why did you pick the price that you did if the answer is i don't know we just decided that it was a cool number well it's not really a strategy um if you've put some thought behind it that's that's most of what this is going for and, and I think part of some of this stuff will also be in your pitch deck. So like, you know, your competitive landscape, you know, you might, that might be an aspect that's in your pitch deck and you can, you, you know, you can simply put in the notes here. Ah, this is in our pitch deck. Take a look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, Same as sales strategy. You'll probably talk through it. It can be verbal unless there's some sort of like, you know, reason for a diarized document um, doesn't necessarily need to be something here, but it might be like a calendar that you have on, you know, we're going to be targeting this, this, and this. Yeah. region or group of customers or these specific people or whatever over the next period of time. So. I think investors actually really want to know a lot about this from my experience. Um, you know, you're, if you've got a sales strategy or if you've got a product that requires a long like onboarding and sales like pipeline, but it's not a very big sale at the end of the day, that's like an automatic like concern for an investor. Um, should be concerned for you too. So, you know, the I, last I, one I think is also really encourage people to, to think about the sales and pricing strategy and the cost to acquire the customer, the cost of service, the customer, and how much money you're ready for those, like very early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the last one I think is also really interesting customer testimonials. Like if you, if you're out in the market already and you have, you know, sort of an MVP product um, or you have some folks that have used your product and are big ambassadors for it, you know, I would, I would encourage people to get you know, testimonials from those folks. I've, I think we've seen it a couple of times with even TNT companies that have gone through the raise process where they've had, uh, I can think of one in particular, maybe I think it was the last summit where a uh, huge ambassador for the product also became one of the largest investors on the cap table. Um, and he was a, he was a big, powerful voice for and proponent for the company. Um, right. So, you know, customer testimonies can be very strong. They have an office across the street and that's how they got tied into all the construction companies is because 
Yeah, he's like a giant ambassador. I was thinking that one, but also another, maybe a medical device company that we talked to or work, working with. Gotcha. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, customer testimonials. And those can be, you know, they're, they're useful for you too. Like the sort of like case study, um, how this impacts a customer, like all this is super important for you when um, you're just like building out your sales pipeline. And I, I really encourage people to have a pretty specific sales strategy plan. Item number 7.3 there, you know, it, is, it, it really helps you stand apart from other early stage companies. If you've really thought through, how are you going to reach your first X number of sales? You know, especially if, especially if you're raising, you're like, we want a million dollars so we can put $700,000 into marketing. Like, how's it going to work? Like, right. Marketing, we're going to hire somebody. All right. You know, I've, I've definitely, I've definitely been in a place where I was like, I need money for marketing without having a plan. And you know, it's, it's, it's not a great place to be. So make sure you've got the full plan. Um, <laughs> Okay, anything else? We're only, we only got six minutes left. So anything else you want to hit on for sales and customers? We kind of talked about that high level. Let, let's, just, let's just do a quick burn through the rest of them. Sure, okay. Brenny, so you take agreements. the agreements. Yeah, this would be like any, any material things that are important. So if you have like a licensing agreement or um, material commercial contracts with like a supplier or a customer, you know, this is kind of where that stuff would go. Doesn't, again, this is a good opportunity to just like summarize, you know, if you have three material contracts, just a quick summary and then have those documents sitting in the back. You don't need to necessarily have the documents um, up front. Yeah. Intellectual property. I'm not this an expert on IP. An important one for many. I'm not an expert on IP, but I know that it's important. Um, have, have a lawyer um, that's, if you have IP, that's a core part of your strategy. Make sure that things are filed. Make sure you have a lawyer that's you know been doing stuff. Um, again, like Brendan was suggesting, a summary is super important here because um, you're probably not going to have somebody read a you know hundred page patent application. Yeah. Um, but you know prior prior search prior art search is important as well. Um, depending on what stage of investment we're talking about, sometimes the investors will do the same thing as Quinn just alluded to. You can get a free IP search done by IRAP, which I actually didn't know. So thanks, Quinn. Um, it's super helpful. Um, but yeah, the IP is, especially if you have IP, uh, like a pretty key part, um, of, of stuff going on here. Yeah. And especially like the strategy around how you're going to use that IP and, you know, it gets expensive as it gets expensive maintaining IP in multiple jurisdictions. So make sure you're thinking all that through. Yeah, right. I've seen the micro voucher used a few times for, for intellectual property. It's really helpful. Yeah. So yeah, I guess for the folks that aren't, that can't see the chat, you can get a micro voucher to pay for IP, IP stuff from Alberta Innovates. So, and I think Mike, if I saw this, Mike Rio is on the call. So is Mike Rio on the call? Yeah. yeah. He can help you. Uh, he can help you. He can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Mike. That program. I, I, can apply to I should look at our participant list before I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, insurance. Yeah. I think like this is just another confirmatory one less probably for investors, more for company. You know, I've seen it a few times where, you know, just having the right policy in place can be, you know, very, very helpful. Um, you know, if you're, let's say, let's call it a hardware company shipping stuff globally, and maybe it's fragile, you know, think about having a shipping policy that will offset, you know, if something gets broken on, 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 on freight. The other one that I, I'd like probably call it here is, you know, key person or DNO insurance, just depending on, you know, post round, post raise, it's, you know, might be something you want to consider. Um, again, this is, this is probably not the forum to talk at length about those things, but uh, this is a, a, an aspect that you could talk to your advisors about. Yeah. I will say most companies probably need, as soon as they start operating with sales, probably need a, a basic form of insurance, like general liability. General liability for sure. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, you know, if you're like an engineering firm, or a consulting practice or something like errors, errors and emissions is probably super important. But if you've raised a significant amount of money, looking into like key person insurance uh, and, and DNO insurance, I think is, is really, really good. Um, you know, just, just to cover any potential liability. Okay, this list is long. I maybe should have checked how long this list was before we got started. We've only got two, three minutes left. Number 11, regulatory compliance legal. We can burn through this one. If you, if you broke the law, disclose it. We'll figure it out. <laughs> if somebody's suing you, disclose it or we'll figure it out. Or if we don't, we'll get really upset. 
Um, and if you're in a regular, if you're in a regulated environment, so you know, cannabis, blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, like finance, uh, health, um, anything, you'll know if you're in one. Yeah. Um, disclose, you know, what it is, how you're managing it. You have a plan for it. You know, it's super important. It should probably be written. Like this is like a real thing. Yeah. Um, so it's highly nuanced, nuanced depending on what industry you're in. But like this is a super important thing if you're in a regulated industry. Yeah. So you might even have a compliance officer or consultant helping you with it. Yeah. Um, data protection. That's the, the last one. Fine. You can burn this one. It's like more, again, more of an internal thing. And it really depends on the stage of your organization. If you're a company with lots of important data, um, you know, having insurance, having external policies, having, you know, IT providers help with that stuff, I think is important. But it's because a lot of people... Um, are, are looking at like they're collecting data to use for something specific. A lot of companies are doing that. These yeah, days. and cybersecurity is becoming a very hot topic now, and it's it can be very expensive if you if your organization gets hacked. Yeah, and you've got like um, you know if you're doing B two C and you're marketing, you know you have you know Castle to deal with. You have the whatever the crazy European one is like around who you can email and cookies and all of this crap. So yeah, uh, or if you're a medical company with uh, you know, customer information. That's also patient information. There's lots of compliance rules around that. Yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah, this one probably not so important for diligence room, at least at early stage, but something to think about um, as you're, as you're growing your company. Okay, guys, we got through it all. I think we're ready to call it quits. It's just about four 30. Uh, great group joining us. Should we, uh, should we just open for questions real quick? Do we're we still five minutes? people on the call to the bitter end. So open question period for those that would like to stick around. People can just put them in the- We covered it all. We covered it all in 90 minutes flat. Everyone is uh, fully understanding how to make their data rooms now. And uh, appreciate uh, actually Tony, shout out to Tony. He posted a number of resources in the chat there. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, if people want to come off mute and say hello, I think you can. Even if you just want to say goodbye, you can do that too. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for putting up with this. This is fun. <laughs> um, any questions in the YouTube chat? I can't I'm see sure. them. I, no one's monitoring YouTube. So okay. thank you for watching us on YouTube. Are there <laughs> any questions, Brandon, in the YouTube chat? No, most folks wanted to come say hi on Zoom, I think. Yeah, good. But it's on YouTube if you want to but watch it. It's on right. YouTube forever now, so you can see this whole conversation to your heart's content for the rest of your lives. Oh, no. <laughs> or I should have done my hair or something. <laughs> uh, miss the Discord chat. Jesse, I'm not sure what to do about that. <laughs> I'll post some messages for you every now and then, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, come you, join us in Edmonton for a few special occasions, especially on the 18th. Um, okay, anyone else? Thanks for everybody for coming. A lot of, a lot of familiar friends on here. Appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to have to sign off. I got to go grab my daughter from daycare. So I have to leave right away here. I still got about a 20 minute commute back to my house. And uh, sorry. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off and see everybody later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody for coming.